And welcome back. George Norrie, along with R.L. Poole. His book is called Beneath the Haunted Sky. R.L., I should ask you, where do people get your book? Oh, thank you for asking. Um, They can get it on Amazon. And I actually have uh, a Kindle countdown deal right now. So everyone who uses the link on your show page and goes over right now can buy the book for $3.99. It'll go up a dollar a day until Christmas where it'll return to its regular price, but people can get acquainted with me and my work for a substantial savings if they've listened to your show. That's a great deal. Right now and take advantage of the deal. Thank you very much. Okay, you were talking about the inside of the craft, and it was kind of nondescript. It was just not as high-tech as I would think it would be. (laughs) Yeah, I I knew you would be disappointed, but um, it was actually, it was just all white, and there was a metal tray. It looked like a medical tray. That was the side where I was laying. Um, and then as I looked down, and it was very difficult for me to lift my head up just an inch just to kind of look down. And uh, I saw that there was something around my genital area down there, but I couldn't feel it or anything. I didn't – I couldn't tell other than the fact that I saw it. Um, and it was just white. It was just – the whole ceiling was just like white light. It wasn't bright. It didn't hurt your eyes. You could see – you could open your eyes – with no problems and everything. Um, and when I did, um, I did open my eyes and I looked around. Um, one of these little guys, these little gray guys leaned over me and saw I was awake and startled. I actually scared him. And uh, he reached over me to the medical tray and he picked up a little cylinder and touched it to my head and I was immediately rendered unconscious. Huh. Now, you, this and, implant you said you had, where is it? Well, with that night, that was the night that I got my implant. I woke up uh, with my regular abduction hangover, and I went in to brush my teeth, do all those things. And it was in my lip. It was in the right, my right lower lip. And I thought it was a very bad place. It drove me crazy. It felt like a little hard plastic BB in there. Oh, geez. That's it didn't so hurt at all or anything. Annoying. Um, yeah, but it was it drove me crazy. I was constantly messing with it and everything. Um, and then a couple of weeks after that, I had actually moved to Pennsylvania, where I live now, uh, from Ohio, thinking I could outrun this thing. But you can't. Um, I woke up on a friend's couch, and uh, it was gone. It was gone from my lip. And I was like, oh, well, maybe they decided they didn't want to abduct me anymore, so they didn't need to have a have an implant. And what I found was, no, they moved it to behind my right ear. It's the same thing. I just found it in a different place. Amazing. Let's take some calls. Let's start by going to Brian in Indianapolis. Hey, Brian, go ahead. Hey, George, good morning. How are you? Good, Brian. Thank you. Hey, listen, the the power of the iPhone. I looked up that star system that Betty and Barney Hill were, the aliens were from. Yep. It's called Zeta. Reticuli. Zeta reticuli. reticuli. That's right. Some 39 That's light years from Earth. How funny is that? Hey, RL, I, it's a, this is a great topic. And, and you got a lot of friends here on coast. And I, I went down this rabbit hole of, uh, of alien abductees uh, about a month ago because we, my wife and I came across Fire in the Sky and we watched it. Oh, the Travis sure. Walton movie. So I've been I've been researching alien abductees, the pros, you know, the abductees, and and then the scientific side of it, like you were talking about. And I've I've come across this term that the people that, that the scientific side of it they use called false memory syndrome. Now you were talking about your parents that wouldn't believe you, and maybe they thought that maybe you might have had a false memory syndrome. I'm not saying that you do. But I'm just saying that and they may not even have known about this term. I've just, I've just come across it because that these people use it a lot. And I just wondered if you know anything about it or have you heard any other abductees that might have that false memory syndrome? Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, Brian, for saying I have friends on Coast to Coast. I definitely feel that I do. Yes, you do. Um, and, but as far as false memory syndrome, it, I did not – falsely remember being in the backyard or any of the events that happened to me or the way that they happened. Um, I, I am a sober person who has a pretty good grasp on reality. 
I am not prone to remember things that didn't happen. In fact, it's the opposite. I have extremely good perception and a very good memory. So it's really the opposite. What I find to be interesting is people who tend to have high perception and good memories are the ones who notice things that people do, other people don't. And when you notice things that other people don't, they assume it's you who has the problem, when I don't think that's the way it is. Especially when you consider the fact that I've spent a lifetime collecting evidence. Um, you, you don't collect all of the pictures and the trace evidence and, and all of the knowing stones and all the things that I have from something that you didn't, that you remembered that didn't happen. These are all tangible artifacts of very real experiences. Well said. Next up, John in Wisconsin. John, you're on with R.L. Poole. Go ahead. Hello, George. Hello, R.L. Hi, John. I have a Hi. comment and then a brief story that leads to a question, please. Um, first of all, you know, there's a number of very well-respected people like R.L. that share their story. And I think for us to deny the existence of extraterrestrial abductions is very short-minded and naive. And by the way, prior to the top of the hour, R.L. explained in detail why people do not get on board with this or deny it. And I encourage everybody to go back to the Insiders podcast and listen to that again from R.L. That was very well said. Now, here's my brief story that leads to my question. Where I live, R.L., which is the north-central part of Wisconsin, a young lady went missing about five months ago. Her car was discovered um, off the road a little bit, but um, not in the woods or anything. Her car was untouched. There was no footprints around it. Her cell phone was in the car. Her purse was in the car. We haven't had a trace of her since. When it comes to extraterrestrial abductions, I am very thankful they returned RL. So RL can share his stories with us and encourage us that this does exist and we can learn from it. My question, RL, and of course your answer would be speculation. This young lady, if she was indeed abducted, why would she not be returned and the good people like RL are returned? And uh, that's my question, and thank you for taking my call. It's a good question. Uh, RL, why are some people apparently taken and never returned if that okay. happens? I want to say that was a great comment, and I appreciate people are really paying attention to the words I'm saying on your program because I've oh, yes. them carefully. Um, but so when you brought up the roadside abduction, a, a chill kind of went up my spine because I have had two times when some I was attempted to be abducted right off of the highway by a craft. Um, and one of them involved uh, literally overriding my motor cortex and making me turn the wheel, trying to get me to pull over to the side of the road. And that was when I realized that these aren't all the same beings and they don't all have the same agenda. You see, in my book, Beneath the Haunted Sky, I actually talk about this where there's kind of a difference between the ranchers, the wranglers, and the rustlers. And you have to know who they are and you tend to know by how they do it. For instance, the Greys, they come and take me from my home. They do whatever it is that they do. They try to erase your memory. They have healed me from any physical injuries, and then they put me back. This is how a rancher would treat their livestock. You would not harm them. You would make sure they were okay. You would do no harm, but you would do whatever it was you were exploiting. Is the craft is the craft RL somewhere around the planet? Where where might it be when they take you? So I'm not they don't I don't believe that they leave the planet. Although I have to tell you, like they said, like the one guy said that Zeta Reticuli was thirty nine light years away from us. Yeah. They told me that all their trips are they take about an average of forty five minutes to get anywhere. That's how long it takes them. They're, they've learned how to bend space and time, haven't they? Yeah, so what they do is they create a bubble around their craft that pushes space-time out around it. So everything that's inside the bubble is immune from the effects of space-time. So time doesn't – they don't have to obey the rules of space-time. So it's like a little pocket dimension that they travel in from one place to another. Um, but we have different beings – 
that are taking people for different purposes. There are people who are ranchers who like for like for me, I'm in some kind of program where they want to take me repeatedly. And there are others who are like poachers who want to take people and do bad things to them. And it's really chance. It's chance because we, we're not well informed enough um, to understand what we should avoid or what we shouldn't. You know, he brought up Travis Walton. I met Travis Walton a few years ago, and uh, we spoke at length. Nice guy, by the way. Oh, he is just the nicest, most humble person that you could ever meet and such a great representative of this phenomenon. It was an honor to meet him. And we shared, we both told each other our stories. And what we had come up with was we were both taken by the same people, the same beings, but for different reasons. And just like how I had been healed by them with my injuries, that he felt like that's what they were doing with him, that they had accidentally injured him and they were trying to save his life. And they did. And he passed a lie detector test, R.L. Yes, and actually I was thinking about doing the same thing so that I can erase those doubts of anybody who might think that I'm making something up or that I'm not being 100% on the level, that I would like to uh, take a polygraph test as well. I think that would be an amazing thing, and to film it. Let's go to Mike in Seattle, Washington. Hey, Michael, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, Hi, George. Hi, uh, R.L. I had a couple questions about um, one is um, the Coral Castle with Ed Lee Scallon. I know it's not really about pertaining to the topic. Um, I was at uh, Coral Castle back in the 90s, and I got a couple pamphlets there. One was um, a book in every home that he made, that he produced, and another pamphlet or book was about electricity. And, magne- and ma- magnetics, right? Yeah, magnetic. Magnet- in fact, he wanted to call it magnicity or something. He didn't like the name, uh, or he didn't like the name electricity. Magnicity. And yeah. 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 I don't know if you're familiar with those two pamphlets that he put out, and I wanted to know a little bit if you know anything about uh, if you can talk to about you know about how he did what he did. Um, when I was there at the time in the 90s, I wasn't really, I guess maybe because of my age, I really wasn't impressed with the place. Um, but now I'm thinking more more and more about it now that I'm in my 50s. And also the the book of every, in every home that he produced was more about family life and home life and his beliefs, which I really didn't agree on. Um, and then the other th- question I had was, have you ever heard of the book called The 33rd Parallel? which the Arthur, he's out of Colorado, and he talks about cattle mutilations and the so-called UFO highway that um, is supposed to go on across the 33rd parallel. And I want to know if you know anything about that, where, it's, where a lot of these UFOs sightings and stuff are happening along the 33rd parallel, lower Colorado, Utah, Arizona, and that sort of thing. Address uh, Edward Leeds Skullman first, if you would, R.L. You've written a couple books about him. Yes, um, and my first book was a number one bestseller in the physics of gravity on Amazon. And I actually, um, not only am I familiar with those booklets, but I am intimately familiar with those booklets, having poured over them for the last 17 years or so. And what he was doing was he was describing something that we have overlooked in physics, and that is the power of magnetism. And not just magnetism, but he appears to be showing that magnetism can be harnessed on a cosmic scale, according to the evidence that I've been able to find, and that he is using uh, celestial bodies like magnets uh, in in a rotational wheel, that when they align at certain places, that you are able to exploit a loophole in physics that we don't understand that will allow you to do some of these things. Now, um, a book in every home is, it was written, and this is what the key of Leeds calling is about, is that I discovered that it was actually encoded in Enigma code. And I found the key for that Enigma code, and then I published that in the book, and I also do all of the decoding and you simply have to, but what I found was that it's 26 pages and each page 
corresponds to a language. I found 26 different languages in the book. Um, and it says all kinds of weird stuff in it that I think people would probably want to know. I feel like he hid most of his secrets in this book in Enigma Code, and it also happens to be encoded in English, which means that it could never be translated back out into English but into another language. But also, it was written in a way that would be offensive to most people, and so it would be a psychological deterrent for them to even investigate in the first place. I believe that is one of the biggest secrets hidden in plain sight that Ed ever created. And it's interesting. And then the 33rd parallel book, I'm not that familiar with. Are you? I'm not familiar with the book, but I am familiar with the theory that they did a, a survey where they looked at where most of the UFO sightings, abductions, experiences were coming from, and they realized that they were fitting a pattern that lay along the 33rd parallel. Um, I believe that these things are happening all over the planet um, to all different types of people. It's not just an American thing. It's not just a South American thing. This is happening everywhere um, to more or less of an extent. Of course, I think it happens in some places more than others. Um, but it is happening globally. Why it's happening, why there would be more instances along the 33rd parallel, honestly, is lost on me at the moment. I do not know why that would be. R. Ellen, how do people find you on YouTube? Oh, yeah, all they have to do is just uh, type in The Haunted Sky, and they'll be able to, they'll see my um, my splash page. And uh, it's also my uh, channel name on here is UFO UAP Magnet. Easy to remember. And also they have the link on your show page if they'd like to follow that as well. Excellent. And folks, if you haven't had time yet, go up to our website and then look at the pictures that RL has drawn about some of his encounters. They're fascinating, but they're right under his name that Lex has posted at coasttocoastam.com. We're going to come back in a moment with RL Poole and take final, final calls. His book we're talking about tonight is called Beneath the Haunted Sky, The Evidence for Alien Abduction. These episodes have occurred with him since he was a little guy, six years old, a long, long time ago. So back with final calls in a moment on Coast to Coast AM. And we're back with R.L. Poole, George Norrie with you. R.L., I assume they communicated with you via telepathy. You are absolutely correct. They did. Did you did you think back telepathically to them, or did you speak? Yes, I've spoken to them. Um, and they explained to me how that works, that they have the ability to go inside your head and talk to you. They have the ability to invade your mind and to say whatever they'd like to say to you. And it comes in forms. It can be words. It can be audible. It can be visual. Um, it can it can be images, symbols, anything that the human mind is able to conjure, they can conjure up to you. And uh, so when they talk to you, they talk to you inside your mind. And then when you answer, you are not projecting your thoughts to their mind. They're staying inside your mind and listening to the answer is how they explain to me it works. Did the topic of God ever come up? We misunderstand everything. <laughs> Just say that. We misunderstand because we live in a world of absolutism that we were either created or we evolved. There is no in-between. And the truth is it's both. That we were partially, you know, we partially evolved and then we were created to be something else. Phones are ringing like crazy. Let's go to Ted, truck driving in Oklahoma. Go ahead, Ted. Yeah, good morning, George. I had a question for Mr. Poole. Sure. You said you had an implant. Is that uh, in your earlobe or behind your ear? Is that there currently? It was in his lip, but apparently it's gone now, right, R.L.? Well, it moved. They moved it from my lip to behind my right earlobe, yes. It's, I'm, I'm actually, I can feel it like right now I'm touching it because <laughs> you mentioned it. Yes. Why, why don't why don't why don't we extract it and take a look at it, see what see what it does? Well, I'm certainly open to that. Um, 
But again, this is all very new. I've lived with this for 40 years, but um, I have only recently come out and told my story and have planned to um, expose as much truth about this phenomenon as I can. So I have, I do have plans for having my implant extracted, for taking a polygraph exam, for doing those things that will help remove doubt from people. I'll tell you what, though, RL, you know, every time they try to reach and get Whitley Strieber's taken out, it moves. They can't catch I, it. I have heard about this uh, phenomenon, and I was worried about that myself, that I don't want this to turn into something um, damaging or uh, something that is going to be fought against. Right. You don't want yeah. them to tear your face up or anything like that. Jeez. For sure. And I don't want there to be any accident like it causes a problem for me. I'm a little bit, if it makes sense, I'm a little bit nervous to have it taken out because I don't know what it's connected to exactly. It's definitely has something to do with tracking, I would think. For sure. Just like how we would track uh, our, our own livestock and things like that, that it's how they know where you are a lot of times. Let's go back to the calls. AC's with us in Cleveland, Ohio. Hey, AC, go ahead. Hello, George, and hello, RL. Hi Hi there. Uh, First of all, George, I I wanted to mention to you that your show has uh, competition from Scandinavia, okay? We have no competition, but that's okay. (laughs) (laughs) So there's this guy named George Norway, and his show is called Fjord to Fjord. (laughs) (laughs) so anyway uh i had a question and a comment for rl okay sure uh first of all uh rl you have a family i i assume i wife and children is that correct i do not you don't have a family no i don't have a family at this time oh okay all right well, the question, I could still ask the question, I guess, that uh, the Bible teaches that uh, every matter is established by two or three witnesses, okay? And you find that in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So my question is, from what I've heard in all your uh, talking about your abduction, mm-hmm. you seem to have been abducted singularly. In other words, there's never been anybody with you. No, but my son had been abducted. Uh, I know at least one time. Okay. And I had other people who have actually witnessed some of these things with me. Uh, My son was a witness to one of the uh, UFOs, the one I have a, a very famous picture of. Uh, that's in my book, Beneath the Haunted Sky, that we saw over the skies of Wright Pat Air Force Base. We witnessed that together. Um, my uh, my wife at the time, uh, we had I had uh, installed a driveway detector into my yard to pick up any large metallic objects that might appear in my fenced off yard, and it went off. And when it went off, uh, we couldn't see anything. So I went down and I started throwing rocks into the yard and bounce them off of an invisible object that seemed to be metallic, invisible, and in the center of my yard. So other people have witnessed these things with me, um, but just not necessarily uh, simultaneous abductions. What are the knowing stones, RL? What are those? So for years, for some reason, when I am abducted, many, not always, but often, I am given a stone. I will come, I will be returned with a stone in my pocket, in the bed, or on a flat surface near where I would be. Just a regular stone? They are black, smooth stones. They look like river stones. Uh. Um, and the only, I actually saw this particular thing years after it was happening to me in the movie called knowing with Nicolas Cage. And oh, that's right. And there's a scene where these, these kids, they keep, are they keep getting these black stones and my son, we were watching the movie together and he said, 
you have a bunch of those, don't you? And I said, yeah, I do have a bunch of them. I had an entire cigar box full of them that I'd collected over the years. And he said, can I see them? And I said, sure. And I, I, we dumped them out on the floor, and he counted them out. It was something like 58, 57 or 58 stones that were all black, all smooth, shiny, looked like river stones. But I had been given these over and over and over again by these beings. In fact, since I gave them to him, he asked me for them, and I gave him the entire box full. And since then, I've collected five more. And the last one I got, I woke up with it in my pocket, and it's in the shape of their head, which is strange. Do they look like a little meteorites, too? They're dark gray, blackish colored uh, stones. And the last one I got has... And, I, and I'm not generally like this, but it has something about it that is different. It has an energy or an aura that you just, when you look at it, you know there's something about that that is different than every stone you've ever seen. First time caller Craig in Houston, Texas joins us. Hello, Craig. Hey, George. Uh, I and uh, RL, I have a couple of questions. Um, I. First off, uh, George, how long have you been hosting Coast to Coast? It's going, we're starting 22 years in January. Wow. I knew I uh, recognized your voice. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was uh, only so many times that uh, I'd been uh, listening to AM radio when I'm driving home from doing something, you know. And I was like, man, I always love your show. I always love your show. Well, thank you. And uh, RL, I had a kind of a multi layered question, but I'm going to try to keep it as uh, three deep as I can. Um, one of the first things that I wanted to ask you is when, when you started, uh, understanding what they were saying to you, um, was it during your abduction and also did it, uh, did it continue afterward? Oh, no, I, I understand your question and I think it's a good one. Thank you. So what will happen is that I would ask them questions. I would see them in the sky. I would know when they were around. It was to the point to where I could literally sense them being somewhere around on the nights I would be abducted. I would look out. I would recognize them. It's because I know all, I know the stars by name. I, I know that's not a star. So I would think this question to myself. I would say, like, for instance, what? why are you taking, for instance, me in particular? Like, I know why you take people now, but why do you take me? And then I would really think on that question. Then I would wake up sometime or 2.30, 3.30 in the morning of that next day, and I would have this download like I knew it all my life. I could sit down and write it all out verbatim, word for word, like I had already known the information, like it was a memory rather than new information. And sometimes they will tell you things. I've been they took me around once and showed me things inside their craft. But uh, generally when I ask them a question, it's like an immediate download. It's not and it'll take time to process it out. Like it'll take me a week maybe to understand what they told me in, a, in an instant. It'll take me a week to figure out the whole thing, to unravel it all. Let's go back to Craig. Craig, any follow-up? Yeah, uh, well, that sounds very familiar to me. And that was uh, my next question is uh, the way that you described them as uh, they said to you that uh, we're like uh, cattle, uh, or, or they are the wranglers and or ranchers, correct? Yes, ranchers. So we are like the cattle. Yes, we are generally not cattle, but we're kind of more thought of by them as like how we think about dogs compared to us. We're about as smart to them as dogs are compared to us. And as you know, dogs are extremely useful and very well loved and that they all have different traits or abilities that will make them desirable for one purpose or another. Did, did so you, I would really, yes. Did you ever see them express anger, RL? I have never seen um, anger or aggression in any way. They're very calm. In fact, they're kind of the opposite. When I When I woke up on the table and – the one little guy leaned across from me. He startled. He was afraid. I wasn't. I looked at him and smiled because I was like, oh, 
this is real. It it really is real. <laughs> and I was just relieved that I was able to be awake to comprehend some of it. And so I felt kind of honored by having that little accident happen. And this little guy was afraid of me. And he startled and reached over and wanted to make me unconscious as quickly as possible. Because compared to them, I'm like a big silverback gorilla compared to one of these little guys. Exactly. You don't want me waking up on the table and getting upset. Nobody wants that. Let's go to Cornelius in Louisiana. Hello, Cornelius. Thanks for holding. Hey, George and Poole. I wonder if you were related to Barry Poole from Rock Hill, South Carolina. But, George, I tell you, I'm about freezing. I told Tommy it's 30 degrees out here because i got to go outside to talk. It's 24 uh, in St. Louis. Oh, ooh, and you're in the cave. I'm in a cave yes, without sir. a heater. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, Mr. Poole, I'm going to tell AC a minute, too, from uh, Cleveland. That's if you have not witnesses, that's two or three people praying for somebody not witnesses, because God has been shown to Moses by himself and stuff like that, and Jacob wrestled with God. But anyway, um, Mr. Poole, they call me the God, Guns, and Gold Man, the Bible, Bullets, and Beans Man. I believe this, to me, is a demonic deception, and you can um, you can see in the Bible where these demons try to have sex or fallen angels having sex with the daughters of men and they form the Nephilim, which are with the giants. And, of course, I think they're doing it today. I told Tommy when I was a federal correctional officer at Oakdale 1, Louisiana, I saw this craft lift up a cow. So I don't think these things are friendly. I'm like Dr. David Jacobs. I think they're all demonic. If you call out in the word Jesus Christ, these things are afraid of Jesus Christ and his word and his name. So to me, they're marking you just like cattle, you know, for some experiment, just like we experiment with different animals and stuff like that. So I don't think we're dogs to them. We're just like cattle to them, and uh, we may be eaten. So God bless you, George. Merry Christmas to everybody. Okay, Cornelius, to be sure. There's 30 seconds left, R.L., Maybe we are fodder for them, huh? Well, I believe that we have a purpose, and they are exploiting us, but they are trying to also protect that purpose. And anyone who buys Beneath the Haunted Sky and reads it will, I think, come away with a much better understanding of the phenomenon that we're dealing with from the perspective of a person who's been inside the situation. Absolutely. R.L., thanks for being on the program again. Keep in touch with us. For Adam Thompson, Tom Danheiser, Dan Galanti, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean LaDessure, Stephanie Smith, Chris Burroughs, Tim Banal, George Knapp, and Ian Punnett. I'm George Norris, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.